your number one source for local news. This is WRAL, coverage you can count on. Now, breaking news from WRAL, coverage you can count on. Breaking news at noon, a jury convicts President Joe Biden's son, Hunter, on all three felony charges in his federal gun trial. We're also following more breaking news in Spring Lake, where an apartment building is on fire there. We have crews on the scene right now. This is video from a WRL viewer. What we have learned about this fire and what's making it especially difficult to fight. Plus, a bill designed to limit who can wear masks in public, and that exposes finance campaign donations, could be headed to Governor Cooper's desk by day's end. We'll explain the next steps. Pinehurst number two welcomes golf royalty to the U.S. Open. We're live in Moore County, where Tiger Woods is playing a practice round prior to teeing off in the 124th championship. <laughs> Hunter Biden guilty on all three felony counts in his federal gun trial. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Renee Chu. And I'm Jeff Hogan. Thanks for joining us. In the last 45 minutes, a jury in Wilmington, Delaware, reached the verdict, making Hunter Biden the first son or daughter of a sitting president to be convicted in a federal criminal trial. Hunter Biden faces up to 25 years behind bars and a maximum fine of $250,000. However, the judge has discretion and Hunter Biden is a first time offender. He is expected to release a statement at any moment. We'll be sure to bring you that as soon as it happens. President Biden has not reacted yet, but ironically is expected to deliver remarks at Everytown's Gun Sense University in D.C. That's at 1.30 today. And happening right now in the WRL Live Center, we're monitoring this situation right now. But what I can tell you is Hunter had no reaction when that verdict was read. Uh, it came so quickly that a lot of his family members were actually not in court when that verdict was read. First Lady Jill Biden, she walked into the courtroom after that verdict was read. But President Biden said that he will accept the outcome of the verdict regardless of the outcome. Uh, he said before the outcome that he believed his son had done nothing wrong and that him and Jill fully supported him. He also ruled out a pardon for his son. Uh, President Biden expressed support and confidence in his son as well. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, President Biden has not commented on this specifically yet, uh, but he is speaking at that gun safety summit later today. We will, of course, be monitoring that and bring that to you. A bill that would ban the wearing of cloth masks in public and crack down on protesters could be on its way to the governor later today. It would also make it harder to know who's bankrolling some political candidates. It would also uh, make it harder uh, to know who's bankrolling some of those political candidates. Critics of the bill spoke out against it this morning. WRL Capitol Bureau Chief Laura Leslie joins us live from the legislative building. Laura. Renee, uh this bill started out, we've been talking about it for a while, right? It started out as a bill to ban wearing masks in public. Now it would just ban wearing cloth masks in public. But in a private meeting, GOP lawmakers last week added a provision that would allow more large political donations to remain anonymous. Uh, Republican lawmakers say Democrats can already get anonymous federal donations because of the way their federal party is set up. They say this just evens the playing field for the GOP. But critics of the change say more transparency is needed, not less. They say taking away state oversight of federal donations will lead to more corruption. Ann Webb with Common Cause NC says it's already hard for voters to know which donors are behind a given candidate. This is only going to worsen that problem. Um, and so the ability to oversee and understand who's influencing our elections is really diminished um, by this policy. Now, this bill passed the Senate last week, and it's expected to pass the House on party lines as well today, and it'll head to the desk of Governor Roy Cooper. In a statement to WRAL this morning, w, uh, Cooper spokesman Jordan Monahan said, Governor Cooper opposes Republicans changing campaign donation rules behind closed doors just months before an election to let out-of-state billionaires rescue their extreme right-wing statewide candidates. Well, Cooper can veto the bill, but Republicans have enough votes to override a veto. Laura Leslie, WRAL News, live in Raleigh. One man is dead and a woman was injured in an early morning crash on Creedmoor Road. That crash shut down the road for three hours while Highway Patrol investigated. WRO's Kelsey Coffey reports from the scene. 
A state trooper on scene says one man is dead and another woman is in the hospital after a crash here on Creedmoor Road. Let's take you to video now so you can see some of the damage. There were two vehicles involved in the crash, an SUV and a Dodge Charger. One of those vehicles was overturned. The trooper says one driver was traveling southbound while the other was in the northbound lane. That's when the two cars collided. One vehicle hit a guardrail and the other went into a ditch. We're working to get an update on the woman's condition. We'll be sure to stay on top of this and keep you updated. Kelsey Coffey, WRL News in Raleigh. Police in Raleigh and Durham are working to solve a pair of early morning shootings. We'll start with Raleigh. Two men are recovering after being shot on Charleston Park Drive just off of Buffalo Road. This video from the WRO breaking news tracker shows the neighborhood as officers investigated around midnight. We're working to find out who was shot and how extensive their injuries are. We're also working to learn if there were any arrests in an early morning shooting in Durham. Police say a woman was shot in an empty lot off Fayetteville Street in East Umstead Street around 1.30 this morning. The woman is expected to survive. Investigators are looking into who shot her and why. Construction officially began today on a new affordable housing community in Raleigh. A groundbreaking ceremony took place this morning for a new community on New Bern Avenue, just off the Beltline. Once complete, New Bern crossings will have 192 housing units. 40 project-based rental assistance units will be set aside for people at risk of homelessness. Being a Raleigh native and understanding the importance of housing and people of all incomes having a place that they can stay, having a place that they can live, and a place that sometimes just gets started. Construction is scheduled to be completed in 18 to 24 months. A new era for Raleigh began today as city leaders officially broke ground on the new downtown city hall. The project has already begun with construction crews preparing the site where the old Raleigh police station once stood. The new 17-story East Civic Tower will add to Raleigh skyline at a cost of $206 million. Raleigh City Manager Marshall Adams-David said it will be a building to be proud of. This project signifies more than just brick and mortar. It is more than having a first class facility in a first class city. It signifies our commitment to our community so that we will have a space that is worthy of you and a space that is worthy of our fantastic staff. Three, two, one. City leaders celebrated the new beginning by breaking ground across the street from where the new East Civic Tower will stand. And breaking news right now in the WRA Live Center. Firefighters are currently battling a massive fire at an apartment complex in Spring Lake. This is viewer video from Facebook. Uh, this is the Brooks on 1166. It's on Pine Knoll Drive in Spring Lake. Right now we are working to learn uh, how many people have been displaced, if there are any injuries. We do have a crew headed to the scene. As soon as we learn anything else, we'll bring it to you from the Live Center. The 124th U.S. Open is just 48 hours away now. The stars are out on the course today. And a lot of folks following Tiger Woods, the three-time U.S. Open champ, playing a practice round this morning. He hasn't played Pinehurst since the 2005 U.S. Open. Pat Welter and Casey Hintz join us live from the course right now. Pat, things changed a bit since Tiger last was there for the event. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, Tiger finished in second place at that U.S. Open here at Pinehurst in 2005, but his score two over par and he feels like the conditions have gotten even tougher since and Casey and I were following him around on his practice round and Casey he said he feels like it's going to be a war of attrition out there but luckily he's got some help. Yeah and who better than the guy or shall I say kid who has seen him hit more golf balls than anyone in this world. Yeah, I'm talking about his 15-year-old son, Charlie. Now, he's not just tagging along. He's got a special role this week through these practice rounds. Tiger said, I tell him what I'm looking for. I trust him with him with my swing. And it's also just good for me mentally. It's just a great experience for both of us. Well, I think that having Charlie out here is, is very special. I mean, to have the, the father-son relationship that we have and extend it into this part of both of our lives. Um, he's playing a lot of junior golf, and uh, I'm still playing out here. So uh, it's neat for him to, to see the guys that he watches on TV and YouTube and TikTok and wherever where the hell it is. 
kids these days, am I right? Now, we can actually see these two playing together maybe sooner than later. Charlie actually participated in one of the local U.S. Open qualifying events. He failed to advance, but, boy, you got to think he's not far behind, and you hear it all the time. Their mannerisms are the same. Pat, we saw that today, just seeing them both on the course was so special. Yeah, a star in the making. Really cool to see the two of them out there together. And Tiger here on a special exemption. Missed the cut at the PGA Championship, but you know what? He said he feels healthy, feels healthy enough to even win it out there. And he was asked about the heat, though, here in North Carolina. He's like, you know what? At my age, I prefer it. Feels like being home back in Florida, Jeff. Uh, the heat will be cranked up in a major championship. Thank you both. WREL is your home for the U.S. Open at Pinehurst. Our team will have complete coverage leading up to and during the tournament. You can find us on your phone, tablet, and TV. First round tees off Thursday morning. I'll be down there bringing you live reports. We saw this site during the men's and women's basketball tournaments. Now the NC State Bell Tower is lit up for the Wolfpack baseball team. NC State beat Georgia to advance to the College World Series. This is a look at the final out and then a big celebration. This is the fourth time in program history NC State is headed to Omaha. And they didn't get to play in the World Series the last time they qualified in 2021 because of COVID. The Wolfpack will play Kentucky on Saturday. Today, there will be a celebration to welcome back the Super Regional Champs at Doak Field at 1.30. UNC is also in the College World Series. They'll play Virginia on Friday. Fans are invited to gather today at Boschmer Stadium to send off the Tar Heels to Omaha. Gates open at 1 and we'll have coverage beginning at 4 o'clock right here on WRL. Next at noon, incredible new information about Celine Dion's struggle with stiff person syndrome. NBC Today's Co Hoda Kotb is standing by live, and I'll talk with her about her interview with Celine, only on WRL. Also, a new training program for Walmart employees, the jobs available and the pay bumps coming for all its hourly workers. And hangry customers and angry food delivery drivers, the tempers flaring over their driver's behavior. Cat. And it is a stunning day out here on the WREL weather patio. 79 degrees, low humidity. I'll let you know when the humidity starts to climb along with the temperatures coming up. Keep watching WREL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. Welcome back. This view over downtown Raleigh shows just how beautiful it is outside, and it feels nice outside, too. When you mix in that 79 degrees, Kat just said, it yeah. looks awesome. <laughs> What's scaring me is Friday a little bit, Kat. It's coming. It's the coming. The Open, yeah. I know. It's going to actually be likely the hottest U.S. Open, at least in Pinehurst, on record. The previous hottest day was 90 degrees back in 2014. And all the way back in 1999, highs were only in the 60s one day there and 70s the other days. Meteorologist Mike Mays was there that year, and he was telling me about it yesterday. We were looking into the data, but 94 on Friday, that's going to be our hottest day. The heat index could reach the triple digits that day, but the heat index forecast is actually backing off a bit for the weekend. We could see another front slip through the area Saturday into Sunday. It won't be a very strong one, but it could lower the dew points a bit. Pinehurst Resort and Country Club is hopping today. Look at all the people out there watching the practice rounds. It's a great day for it. 79 degrees, dew points in the upper 50s. It feels like summer, but it's not feeling like July, August heat out here just yet. So enjoying it, and maybe the U.S. Open has you inspired to do some golfing of your own today. If you're headed out, temperatures are going to be in the mid-80s. Make sure that you've got the sunscreen and the water today. Summer heat is back, though, for the U.S. Open. 91 Thursday, 93 in Pinehurst, both Friday and Saturday, and 91 on Sunday. So each day should be hotter than any other day has ever been at Pinehurst in the U.S. Open. Looking ahead, though, at least rain chances are low. I don't know. You know, it's kind of a trade-off. Would you rather have the rain to interrupt the golfing or, you know, some warm temperatures? So at least we've got the mainly dry weather. It's only a 20% chance for rain Saturday and Sunday. Mostly sunny Friday through Sunday, partly 
partly cloudy on Thursday. So maybe you'll be able to find some clouds out there Thursday if you're going to be out at the U.S. Open. Forecast rainfall is closer to the coast. Just some sea breeze showers setting up this week. Not expecting to really see anything notable here in central North Carolina. So we'll keep an eye on the pattern for you. But a cold front has stalled off the southeast coast. And as we get into June in hurricane season, you've always got to watch these stalled fronts. We could see low pressure try to take on some tropical characteristics by the end of the week. Meteorologist Mike Mays and myself, we first told you about this yesterday evening. The National Hurricane Center catching on now, giving it about a 20% chance of happening over the next seven days. Yesterday, the European model ensembles had a better chance, but we'll watch with the update that we'll get in around 2 o'clock this afternoon. High temperatures tomorrow, upper 80s in the Triangle, 90 in Fayetteville. Looking ahead to Thursday, we could be in the mid-90s by Fayetteville uh, for Fayetteville by Thursday. Over the next seven days, temperatures are climbing. Once we get to Thursday, the rest of the seven day forecast highs are in the 90s. That's five days in a row. 91 degrees, a 20% chance for rain for Father's Day on Sunday. Don't forget to pick up those gifts for Father's Day. I think a lot of golf dads out there would like some of that U.S. Open Pinehurst merchandise, Jeff. All right, Kat, I'll take it back. Thank you. Coming up tonight on WREL, an NBC News exclusive primetime special. Legendary singer Celine Dion opens up for the first time since being diagnosed with stiff person syndrome to today's Hoda Kotb. During the rare one-on-one, -on -one, Celine shared a candid look at how she is coping with the illness. Joining us live from New York with a preview of their conversation is Hoda. Hoda, great to see you and thank you so much for joining us. When you sat down with Celine, what was your sense of how she was feeling both mentally and physically going into this interview? Hi, Renee. It's so good to see you. Um, I didn't know what to expect when I flew to Vegas to sit with her because I knew she had stiff person syndrome, but I actually didn't know a whole lot about it. It's so rare. Only one in a million people get it. And then she explained it to me while she was sitting there. She said, it's as if someone is taking you by the throat and choking you and you can't speak or sing. And that has hit her when she's been on stage before. Sometimes when you see her singing and then she puts the mic out to the audience, she was doing that to give herself a break. Mm -hmm. And so she talked about what it was like dealing with stiff person syndrome and how it would affect how she walked. She had to make sure there was a chair there and a chair there and a chair there so that when she was walking, she would have something to hold on to. And she found her body failing her and her voice failing her. And she wondered, like, am I going to be able to sing again? Because she wanted to hit those notes that she's always hit. And so this is a story of kind of rebirth, someone who is coming up kind of from the ashes and trying to reinvent. Because stiff person syndrome does not go away. There's not a cure. It's progressive. But she's learning how to deal with it and to find a new lane for herself. And as she told me, she's super determined to get back on stage. But I cannot believe what she's been dealing with privately for the last four years or so. And Hoda, those symptoms that she described, so painful, is that day-to-day -day life for her? Does that go away, then come back? Is that what she's dealing with every day? Well, she's got it. You know, she takes some, uh, some, uh, like a, some medicines, and it's mm -hmm. some kind of cocktail that they've created specifically for her. But before that, she didn't know what it was, so she took one Valium, she said, before she went on stage to loosen her muscle so she could sing. Then she took two, then she took three, and she told me at one point she was taking 90 milligrams of Valium, which is enough to kill a person. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know because her body kept, you know, she needed more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So now she's on a better regimen. She has kind of trained her kids on what to do if her body starts to go into that state, which is all the muscles get super hard. And at one point, you'll see in this documentary, her she just has tears coming down. She can't speak. She can't move. She can't do anything. So until she kind of makes her way out of it. So it's a difficult illness. But this woman is determined to get back on stage and sing again. And she told me that she doesn't care if she has to crawl. She's going to get back on stage. And I have to tell you, sitting across from her, I believed her 100 percent. We know she's a strong person and certainly her resilience is as big as her voice, which we all hope to hear uh, one day again on stage. Hoda, thank you so much. To hear more of Celine's very personal interview uh, with Hoda, tune in tonight for that one hour primetime special starting at 10 right here on WREL. Hoda, thanks.
We can take you to live pictures right now in Spring Lake, where that fire we told you about off the top of the show, an apartment building is on fire there. This is that new video we're seeing live pictures right now as crews are there pouring water on top of that apartment complex. We'll tell you what we have learned about this fire, what is making it so difficult to fight. You see the damage right there. We'll take it to the live center when we return. Happening right now in the WRA Life Center, we want to take you back out to that apartment fire in Spring Lake. We have a photographer there. This is a live picture of firefighters battling the fire. The Brooks on 1166 is what this complex is. This is on Pine Knoll Drive in Spring Lake. There are multiple fire departments there. It appears as if a lot of the roof is gone, damaged. A lot of these uh, apartments are damaged. We are unsure of any injuries right now. We're working to learn more details. As soon as we have anything, we will bring it to you from the Live Center. Michelle, thanks. Walmart is offering a new training program for employees to fill high demand roles. The big box retailer is rolling out as a pilot program for 100 store and warehouse associates in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Training options include HVAC technicians, opticians, and software engineers. Walmart will also offer yearly bonuses for their hourly workers of up to $1,000. Billionaire Elon Musk is threatening to ban Apple devices from all of his companies after the tech giant announced a partnership with OpenAI. Apple is updating its voice assistant Siri to allow users to tap into OpenAI's chat GPT. But Musk posted concerns on X, saying that if Apple integrates with OpenAI, it would be an unacceptable security violation. Disney's first black princess is inspiring a new attraction at Walt Disney World. Tiana's Bayou Adventure opens in Orlando, Florida, June 28th. The new ride replaces the Splash Mountain attraction, but keeps the same concept as the log flume. It is inspired by the movie The Princess and the Frog and features a look into Tiana's home and her kitchen where she makes her famous beignets. The ride is also going to be built at Disneyland in California, but an opening date for that has not been announced. Krispy Kreme is ramping up its competition with rival chain Dunkin' for bite-sized donuts. The Charlotte-based company is adding four new donut dot flavors to its lineup, powdered, sprinkled, cinnamon, and cookie crumb. This week, customers can score a 10 count of donut dots for a dollar with the purchase of any dozen donuts. The parents of the children who survived a school massacre in Uvalde, Texas, are suing two major companies. Why they are demanding a jury trial in a lawsuit against FedEx and UPS. Plus. Pretending that your issues don't exist. And coming that's up at 12 look at the importance of men seeking help for anxiety or depression. And here's a look at your winning NC Education lottery numbers. From WRAL, coverage you can count on. And breaking news right now in the WRAL Live Center, a story we've been following since the beginning of the show. Hunter Biden guilty on all three felony counts in his federal gun trial. Uh, he actually just released a statement. Uh, he said he is disappointed in the outcome. He is disappointed in the verdict, but he is very grateful for all of the family love. He just left the courthouse with his wife and First Lady Jill Biden about five minutes ago. Uh, but a jury in Wilmington, Delaware, reached the verdict this afternoon. He faces up to 25 years behind bars and a maximum fine of $250,000. Hunter had no reaction when that verdict was read this afternoon. It came so quickly that a lot of his family was not even in the courtroom when that happened. The first lady actually missed the reading of the verdict. Uh, but President Biden said before the outcome he believed that his son did nothing wrong, but he will accept the verdict regardless of the outcome and he will not issue a pardon for his son. Biden is expected to speak at a gun safety summit in Washington in an hour from now. We are unsure if he will make any comment on this, but of course we will be following that very closely for you. Michelle, thanks. New at noon, more than 200 new jobs are coming to Durham County. The company bringing those jobs chose North Carolina over Texas for its new headquarters. WRL's Noah Klein is here with what those jobs are and how much money could be coming to Durham County, Noah. And so whoever inherits the 
children's match is going to have to deal with whatever. 203 jobs for Iona. This is a story we first brought you on WRL.com. Our NC Capital team's been working this one all day. Iona essentially brings together, it's a partnership with BMW, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes-Benz, and Stellantis. It was created to speed up the transition to electric vehicles. The company plans to bring those jobs between 2025 and 2029. The positions would pay an annual average salary around $128,000. Governor Roy Cooper says this company made the right decision choosing North Carolina. We are here in North Carolina leading the charge toward a bright, clean energy future. And we know that zero emission vehicles will be a critical part of it. This is just the latest clean energy win for state economic developers who have focused on bringing companies just like this one to North Carolina. Back in April, Boviet Solar said it plans to build its first North American plant in Greenville. That project is expected to create 908 jobs in the Pitt County city as part of a $294 million expansion. Since 2017, the state has announced at least 17,000 500 jobs focused on energy efficiency or producing products that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Those jobs have been tied to projects that have brought more than $22.1 billion in capital investment to the state. Noah, thanks. Teachers and staff members in Durham Public Schools are feeling better about the future. Their confidence is up after Durham County Commissioners approved a $966 million budget. It includes a $27 million increase in school funding. The budget passes four to one. <laughs> Dozens of school employees erupted in applause after learning about the decision. Durham Public Schools plans to use the increased funding to boost pay for teachers and staff. This comes after months of walkouts and protests. Teachers we spoke with say they are happy with the outcome. It means that I won't have to go get a second job. <laughs> That's something that was coming. This budget hopefully will get me paid for my master's degree that I'm not getting paid for and hopefully help bring us up to a living wage. Brenda Howerton was the only commissioner who voted against the budget. She cited concerns about increases to taxes. You can go to WRL.com for a full breakdown of what this means for your tax bill. Passengers hurt on a severely turbulent plane ride last month will be compensated. The Singapore Airlines flight left dozens hurt and one person was killed. The airline says it offered each passenger who suffered minor injuries $10,000. Those who suffered more serious injuries are invited to discuss an offer. All passengers on the flight were refunded their ticket. Families of the survivors of the Robb Elementary School shooting in Uvalde, Texas, are suing UPS and FedEx. The families claim the companies violated state and federal law and their own corporate safety standards and are responsible for the trauma and distress of survivors as a result. The lawsuit claims the gunman, who was not 18 at the time, ordered the gun online and shipped it to the gun store where it was picked up. The suit then alleges the companies shipped an enhanced trigger system to the gunman's house, allowing him to convert the weapon into a fully automatic or semi-automatic weapon. UPS says it complies with all federal laws and the lawsuit has no merit. FedEx said it is committed to the lawful, secure and safe movement of regulated items and it complies with all laws and regulations. We now know the name of the Raleigh woman killed in a crash on eastbound US-70 in Johnson County. Sky 5 flew over the scene at Swift Creek Road yesterday afternoon after a tractor trailer crashed into three cars. 79-year-old Bonnie Wheatley died at the scene. Her husband was taken to the hospital with serious injuries. Troopers say the driver of the tractor trailer, Robert Wallace, is charged with misdemeanor death by motor vehicle. Six other people are injured. No word yet on their conditions. Dogs entering the U.S. will soon need to pass a series of regulations. U.S. Customs and Border Patrol says starting August 1st, dogs must appear healthy, be at least six months old, microchipped, and accompanied by a CDC dog form before they're allowed into the country. CDC says this is an effort to curb the spread of rabies. Proof of rabies vaccinations may also be required. You've heard the term hangry, right? It describes someone's temper when they're hungry. Although food delivery services are helping people get their meals in a pinch, some tempers are now flaring over the behavior of some of those delivery drivers. Deborah Valentine has a closer look. 
The COVID-19 pandemic helped usher in a new age for food deliveries, with demand only rising in its wake. But with a growing number of consumers ordering from Uber Eats, DoorDash and more, cities nationwide are also seeing an uptick in complaints about delivery driver behavior, especially from those on two-wheeled vehicles. Whether that's riding on the sidewalk or riding in a bike lane or riding against the traffic or riding through a red light. And authorities are cracking down. Boston officials have issued a letter to food delivery companies over a, quote, alarming increase in unlawful and dangerous operation of motorcycles, mopeds and motorized scooters. Asking them uh, to answer a set of questions related to how they enforce drivers safety training when it comes to two-wheeled vehicles. Officials say a high number of these vehicles are also unregistered in New York City. Officials have seized roughly 13,000 scooters and mopeds so far this year. We're not going to tolerate it. In Washington, D.C., officials recently started the Operation Ride Right program to help monitor if drivers of two-wheeled vehicles are complying with the rules of the road. They've already made several arrests. Uber issuing a statement saying, in part, quote, safety is always a top priority and couriers are often reminded of their responsibility for following local traffic laws. A similar statement from DoorDash reads, in part, quote, the overwhelming majority of dashers do the right thing. That was Deborah Valentine reporting. And this is the month, June dedicated to men's mental health. Still to come, how experts say you can prioritize mental wellness. Plus, many smokers are not getting screened for lung cancer, even if you've quit for several years, why you may still need to get one. Take WRL News with you wherever you go by downloading the WRL News app. Get breaking news, weather alerts, and local reporting all on your favorite device. June marks Men's Health Month, and while anyone can experience depression or anxiety, men often tend to push off getting help when they need it. Oftentimes we see men kind of escape from whatever it is that's bothering them. So whether it's more time at work or losing themselves in some sort of project or watching sports or something like that, but to an unhealthy level where they're kind of ignoring whatever the problem is. To keep their mental health in check, experts say men should identify friends or family members they can confide in. Journaling can be another effective way to get out difficult emotions. Most importantly, if feelings of depression or anxiety become overwhelming, seek help from a mental health professional. Few Americans are getting the recommended lung cancer screenings. The American Cancer Society analyzed data from around 26,000 Americans who were eligible for lung cancer screenings. They found that fewer than one in five people who are eligible to get screened for the disease are actually up to date with it. Current smokers between the ages of 50 and 80, as well as those who may have quit less than 15 years ago, should have an annual screening for lung cancer. People born between 1965 and 1980, Gen X, are getting diagnosed with cancer at a higher rate than their parents and grandparents. New research suggests that if this trend continues, millennials and younger generations will experience high rates of cancer as well. Researchers attribute the rise in cancer rates to lack of exercise, obesity, and the high consumption of red meat. Working out in the evening may be the best way to control blood sugar for overweight and obese adults. Researchers in Spain found moderate to rigorous exercise in the evening helped improve overall glucose levels in men and women compared with being inactive. Pre-diabetics recorded the best results. The 13th Amendment ended slavery throughout the United States, but many enslaved people didn't know they were free for over two years. Coming up, how local residents plan to commemorate the federal holiday known as Juneteenth. An elementary school custodian is proving you don't have to be rich to give back. How he's raising money to set students up for successful futures. Juneteenth, or Freedom Day, is an American holiday that commemorates June 19th, 1865. On that day, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved black Americans in Texas learned they were free. Now a federal holiday, many cities across the nation set aside time to learn more about the history and celebrate the achievements of black Americans. 
Joining us here to talk about the Capital City Juneteenth celebration, Earl Imes, curator of African American history at the North Carolina Museum of History. Thank you so much, Earl, for coming in. You're welcome. I Thank know you, it's a Jeff, busy, busy week, but what is at the core of this commemoration? Well, the core of Juneteenth symbolized freedom for all, if, in, in, in a nutshell. And it's when coined as when the last formerly enslaved people learned about freedom. Uh, at the end of the Civil War, it's important to note that the Civil War ended here in North Carolina mm -hmm. and was now Durham County. And so freedom was being realized, and when the war ends, when Juneteenth comes out, the war's over. So to spread the news of the Emancipation Proclamation is one thing, uh, but it's also a lot of North Carolinians who are involved with that, taking the freedom experience from North Carolina out to Texas. But also politically, what it's doing is it's accomplishing the ratification of the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery, which accomplishes freedom for all Americans. And I know you have a lot of events planned for it. It's a family-friendly event. There'll be lots of food and fun out there. It's actually kicking off tomorrow. You were trying to tell me about the, the footprint. It's citywide. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is the fourth year of the annual Capital City Juneteenth celebration. We're the official Juneteenth for the city of Raleigh. And it's a, a footprint of activities uh, in the downtown area particularly, which begins at the National Cemetery uh, with a wreath laying dedication at 10 a.m. tomorrow to some United States colored troops who were part of Juneteenth here mm. in Raleigh in April of 1865. And from April through the end of the year, there were United States colored troops who were spreading the news of emancipation and freedom here in the capital city, literally coming in from Goldsboro, North Carolina. Certainly a meaningful start to Absolutely. getting things kicked off. And you also have a comprehensive know before you go section online, right, uh, that includes a map. What are the people going there? What are they allowed to bring? What are they allowed not to bring? Well, there are a lot of things. The, the Dix Park event is 12 to 6 on Saturday. It's the main event of the Capital City Juneteenth. But leading up to it on Thursday, uh, we have a Finding Our Roots genealogy conference at uh, Historic SD Hall at Shaw University, the South's oldest HBCU. And then for, uh, Thursday afternoon, we have a keynote, uh, Searching for Freedom. Uh, by the way, it's sold out, Mr. Stedman Graham, but the film itself, in the Emmy-nominated PBS film, Searching for Freedom, George H. White and uh, the last black congressman from Reconstruction who's from North Carolina. And uh, with that, uh, the Saturday event is the main event. And then Sunday uh, ends with a commemoration service and a history service at Historic St. Paul AME Church, mm -hmm. which is the catalyst for the event. And that's the site of the first Freedmen's Convention in America in 1865 that took place at the same time. Big happenings on the main stage there. Harvey yes. Hill at Dix Park, Saturday noon is the time. So please RSVP on Facebook to help organizers plan for the number of folks that are to come out to keep you informed of any updates and weather alerts as well. And WRL's Ken Smith and Lena Tillette will serve as MCs of this. WRL is a proud community sponsor of this event. Earl Imes, thank you so much. For thank you. Help. And I think Ken Smith is our official food taster. Oh, at the event. Yes. we know that better, <laughs> better than anybody. So he'll be a, he'll excel in that role. Very good. Thank wish you. you. Wish you a great event. We look forward to seeing everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Renee. Ken takes the food taster role very seriously. <laughs> if only we could extend this beautiful and comfortable weather all the way through the weekend. Uh, temperatures like this, such a gift. Let's get out to Cat Campbell out on the WRL weather patio and all that sunshine out there, but how it feels, Cat, is just wonderful. Oh, it feels great out here today, Renee. It's about 80 degrees. The humidity is low. We are enjoying the sunshine. It's very bright out here today. But when you get these warm temperatures, you get to June, July, you got to start watching any fronts that are on the map. And the reason why is sometimes the setup that we have is for these fronts to stall out. And that's when you can get areas of low pressure that develop a bit closer to home. We call these homegrown tropical systems. And it's not likely that one would develop, but there is a chance that we could see one develop off the southeast coast over the next week. It would be toward the end of this week. The National Hurricane Center gives that about a 20 percent chance of happening. You can already see low pressure trying to been up along the front. We'll watch to see if an area of low pressure closer to Florida is able to track along that front. The European model ensembles first sniff this out and we're giving it about a 50% chance of developing into a tropical depression. That chance is now down to 30% with the new ensemble runs that we have in today. But the general motion, if this were to develop, would be to be moving away from us. So I do want to reassure you of that. However, it's beach season. This could lead to rip current risks, rough surf. So it's something we'll continue to monitor for you. There is a greater likelihood, though, that we see something develop near 
the Bay of Campeche as we get into the weekend, perhaps into next week. And I've been telling you about that since the beginning of the month. That's been highlighted for a couple of weeks now. The good news is in the main development region, we've got all the Saharan dust, and that's going to help limit any tropical development there because the air is quite dry. But we expect to see that this time of year. So that's not unusual to see Saharan dust helping us out. Today, it's beautiful. Just some fair weather cumulus clouds on our North Hills camera. 79 here in the Triangle, 82 in Fayetteville and 73 degrees in Roxborough. It's beautiful outside today. If you want to head to the playground, it will be warm. Temperatures are in the mid 80s. Make sure that you're touching, you know, the equipment that the kids are playing on for a few seconds to make sure it's not too hot out there because the sun really is beating down on us today. If you want to do lunch outside, it's 81 degrees. A good day to eat outside, especially if you can find a table with an umbrella or in the shade. For the next seven days, we just have two days left today and tomorrow in the 80s. And then every other day on our seven day features highs in the 90s. 94 on Friday will be the hottest day and the most humid day. The weekend will be in the low 90s. Father's Day is Sunday, a 20% chance for rain both days this weekend. We should stay in the 90s into early next week. After all, it is June. And it will feel like it. Kat, thank you. You don't need millions of dollars or a fancy title to make a huge impact on the lives of others. How a custodian is helping students scrub out the challenges that stand in the way of their dreams. And look at your winning Powerball numbers. We wrap things up with a look at a few of the headlines we're following for you today. Hunter Biden is found guilty on all three counts in his federal gun trial. A jury found the president's son guilty on three charges, including false statement material to firearm sales and possession of a firearm by a drug user or drug addict. The verdicts carry a max sentence of 25 years, and each count carries a max fine of $250,000. A sentencing date has not been set. A bill that would ban the wearing of cloth masks in public and crack down on protesters could be on its way to the governor later today. It would also make it harder to know who's bankrolling some political candidates. Critics say the policy will lead to more corruption. The bill is expected to pass in the House today. More than 200 new jobs are coming to Durham County in a $10.1 million investment. Iona LLC is hiring 203 jobs as part of a partnership between multiple BMW, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes-Benz, and Stellantis. The goal is to speed up the transition to electric vehicles. The company plans to develop a new high power charging network with at least 30,000 chargers. A custodian at an elementary school in St. Louis is making a difference for the students he sees daily, not just with his broom and mop, but by unlocking their potential. In 2017, while earning less than $12 an hour, George Love says God spoke to him and told him to make a difference for the students. By moonlighting as a Lyft driver, he began funding $500 scholarships for college. Since he started his scholarship program seven years ago, he has awarded more than 100 awards. There's nothing better than pouring into the life of our future and changing the trajectory of their mindset and, 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 and letting them see that where they at isn't always where it's going to be. Mr. Love hopes to expand his scholarship program to other cities. NBC News Daily is next on WREL, your next local news update in 30 minutes. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.